All right, well, good evening, everyone, and welcome back to another installment of Night Skies of Fort Collins. Um, if you haven't joined us here before for Night Skies of Fort Collins, my name is Ben Gondres, and I am the Dome Theater Manager at the Fort Collins Museum of Discovery. And it's my pleasure to bring the night skies to you each week to tell you a little bit about what you can find in the night skies above you. Now, if you're not watching from Fort Collins, that is totally fine. Everything that I talk about should be visible in your night skies as well, as long as you're located in the Northern Hemisphere, um, with some slight variations on timing based on exactly where you are located in your, your, your latitude. Um, so yeah, if you're not watching from Fort Collins, don't worry. We will uh, still talk about some really amazing things and uh, yeah, hopefully you can get outside to see them yourself. Now, uh, of course, if you are in Fort Collins, you know that unfortunately the past few days have not been great for stargazing uh, with the smoke and now the snow. Uh, but fortunately, it looks like perhaps by this weekend, we will once again get clear skies and uh, be able to see those uh, stars again in all their glory. Uh, so everything that I am going to talk about tonight is going to be visible in tonight's sky as well as in for, for the next few nights. So you can go out um, and uh, see the different things that I'm going to talk about um, in the next few days, hopefully. All right. So with that said, we are going to be using a virtual planetarium program called Stellarium. And Stellarium is a really fun program to use. In fact, when uh, it's not possible to go stargazing, it's just a lot of fun to use Stellarium to look at the virtual night sky and just explore it. Um, it's a great way to get familiar with different constellations and where objects are located. And I'm also going to show you another really cool free tool from NASA a little bit later in the show that we're going to use to explore a bit of the surface of the moon. Um, so make sure you stay tuned for that. Now Stellarium, as I said before, is a free and open source program. Here it is uh, over on my side here, <laughs> and uh, which means it's free to use and download. Um, and there's also a web version on Stellarium's website if you don't want to download it. And again, uh, just a really great way to explore the night sky, especially when you can't actually do it in real life uh, if it's cloudy or smoky. Okay, so I think with that being said, oh yeah, I did want to mention too that if at any point during the program you are enjoying the program, we do ask that you uh, consider supporting the museum through making a small donation. If you're on Facebook Live right now, you can do that by clicking on the little donate button right below. Um, and if you are on uh, YouTube Live, you can also visit our website at fcmod.org slash donate to make a donation of any size. We do rely on your generosity to continue bringing these types of programs to you. So we really appreciate um, any help that you can provide in doing that. All right, I think with that said, let's go ahead and jump into Stellarium and check out the night sky. So as you can see, we're sitting here at the current time at Fort Collins, so at about 6.05. And uh, you can see that the sun is getting ready to set here. Um, and if you've joined us for the past few weeks here, you may have noticed that during this time when we're starting, I always start uh, at the current time, the sun is getting lower and lower in the sky. Um, at, a, at the same time. And that, of course, is due to the tilt of the Earth on its axis. And we're actually approaching the autumn equinox, which is when the Earth is tilted with its equator facing directly towards the sun. So the northern hemisphere of the Earth and the southern hemisphere of the Earth are getting equal amounts of daylight and nighttime, uh, 12 hours of each, in fact. And you'll notice if we move time forward here that the sun will set just a little bit north of west. Let's do it a little slower here. And on the autumn equinox, which is going to happen on September 21st, the sun will actually set almost exactly due west. So we'll get to see that in just a little bit here. All right, so we'll go ahead and let the sun set a little bit more so that we can see the stars in the sky and we'll go till about 8 30 here and in tonight's show i wanted to focus on one main constellation and this constellation is located currently in the northeastern sky so let's go ahead and turn ourselves around you can see we're facing west currently so let's turn ourselves around and look to the northeast and this constellation that i'm going to be focusing on for tonight's show 
is what is known as a circumpolar constellation. And a circumpolar constellation is just a collection of constellations, let's actually face north here, that seems to circle around our pole star or Polaris or the North Star. And if we look over uh, in uh, the northwest here, you might find a really familiar set of stars. These seven stars here, which of course make up the Big Dipper. The Big Dipper is part of the constellation of Ursa Major, the Big Bear. And if we follow the two stars in the end of the Dipper here, Dubai and Merak, and we use them to point ourselves, uh, we can travel along a line about three fist lengths to this star right here, which is Polaris. And Polaris is at the tail end of Ursa Minor. Now Polaris uh, does not seem to move throughout the night. If we move time forward, you can watch the other stars seem to slowly circle around Polaris. And this is because Polaris lies almost directly above the North Pole of the Earth, or the axis that the Earth rotates on. And so it does not seem to move throughout the night. However, throughout the night, these circumpolar constellations, or constellations located in this region, seem to circle around Polaris, so circumpolar. Now the constellation that I'm going to focus on is actually just across from Polaris, uh, from Ursa Major. And this constellation is made up of a wide W of stars. And I'm going to bring it to the center of the screen here, but hopefully you can already see a W shape in the stars. And if you are looking at these stars right here, boop, 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 boop. This in, in fact is the constellation of Cassiopeia. Now in Greek mythology, Queen Cassiopeia was the wife of King Cepheus. <clears throat> and she thought she was more beautiful than the Nereids, which were sea nymphs. One of those sea nymphs, however, was married to Poseidon, and they appealed to him to punish Cassiopeia for her boastfulness. After some fighting, it was Poseidon who placed Cassiopeia and Cepheus in the sky. Cassiopeia, the myth goes, uh, was condemned to circle the celestial pole forever, for all time and spends half the year upside down in the sky as punishment for her vanity. Now in the artwork, which I've turned on here, you can see she's usually depicted on her throne, still combing her hair, or in this art artwork's case, looking at a mirror. So she's still pretty vain. Now the wide W pattern of Cassiopeia is tilting up in the Northeast these nights. You can see, uh, the horizon here and tilting up to the northeast. Now Cassiopeia, being a queen, uh, has many treasures around her in the night sky to find. And these are what are known as deep sky objects, which basically means they're not stars, they're not planets in our own solar system, but they're other objects like clusters of stars, nebula, and even other galaxies. So I wanted to point out a few of Cassiopeia's treasures here. Now, if you look below this last segment in this wide W, um, by about uh, the segment's length, you'll find a little fuzzy patch right about here. And I don't know if you guys can see this in the live stream, but we're gonna go ahead and zoom into this area space to get a better view of it. All right, here we are. And this object is known as the Persia Double Cluster. And it's actually a double uh, cluster of stars. And this is one of the most popular, one of the more popular stargaze, deep sky stargazing targets to look at, as you can usually find it even through a fair amount of light pollution. And these two star clusters are known as NGC 869 and NGC 884. All right, let's zoom out a little bit. And you may have noticed a couple of other objects just to the left of the Perseus double cluster. And these two objects are known as the Heart and Soul Nebula. And they're both what are known as Emission Nebula. Located about 6,000 light years from Earth, the Heart and Soul Nebula form a vast star forming complex that makes up part of the Perseus spiral arm of our Milky Way galaxy. 
The nebula to the upper right, this one here, is known as the heart and uh, is designated IC1805 and named after its resemblance to a human heart. You guys see a human heart there? I can kind of see it. To the lower left is the Sol Nebula, right down here. And this uh, Sol Nebula is also sometimes called the Embryo Nebula, or IC1848. The Heart and Sol Nebula stretch out nearly 580 light years across, covering a small portion of the diameter of the Milky Way, which itself is roughly 100,000 light years across. All right, let's zoom out a little bit. And once again, here is Cassiopeia. And the ne next object is actually something fun I found while exploring the skies around Cassiopeia. And if we zoom in just below this second dip in the W, we'll see another fuzzy patch of cosmic dust. All right, there it is. And this cosmic cloud of space gas is called NGC 281, or the Pac-Man Nebula. Now, do you guys see the Pac-Man video game character in this nebula? I can kind of see it. Round shape, little rectangular mouth. That's pretty fun. <laughs> Some people also think this nebula looks like a heart. NGC 281 is a rather diffuse red glowing emission nebula. It includes a small yet noticeable uh, open star cluster, IC1590, and some really dynamic dust lanes, which are those darker patches that you see in this nebula. The prominent lane of dark dust cutting into this glowing nebula creates the mouth of the nebula's shape. All right, let's zoom out so we can see this whole portion of sky once again. And by 9 or 10 p.m., two of the best known deep sky objects, the double cluster in Perseus, which again is located right here, and the great Andromeda galaxy M31 are in high view in the east. Did you know that they're only 22 degrees apart? So here is the Perseus double cluster. And if you can see a small, fuzzy, elongated patch right here, this is the Andromeda Galaxy, or M31. Let's go ahead and zoom into that. There it is. And the Andromeda Galaxy is really interesting because it's very similar to our own Milky Way Galaxy. In fact, astronomers studying it uh, have learned a lot about our own home in uh, the universe by studying the Andromeda Galaxy. Now, if you've joined me here before, you might have also heard me tell you that the Andromeda Galaxy and our own Milky Way Galaxy are actually on a collision course. That's right. They're due to collide with each other in about four to five billion years or so. It should be a really spectacular sight to see, so I hope someone is there to take some pictures. Now, both the Perseus Double and the Andromeda Galaxy are fourth magnitude in brightness. And in the brightness scale for astronomy, the lower the number, the brighter the object, with a one being the brightest stars in the night sky. So a magnitude four is fairly dim, but should still be visible with the naked eye with no, light no to little light pollution. And you can find both of these objects to the lower right of Cassiopeia for these next few nights. And if you can't find them, if you're having a hard time, if there's some light pollution around, you can always use a pair of binoculars, which will help you out quite a bit. All right, so that was just a few of the treasures that Cassiopeia holds around her, Cassiopeia the Queen. So I hope you can find them for yourselves once the skies do clear up. Let's see if I've got any questions here. Excellent, you guys see Pac-Man. I know, it's pretty fun. <laughs> All right, so with that said, let's go ahead and turn ourselves to the, oh, excuse me, no, we're gonna turn to the Northeast and move time forward just a little bit. And tonight and tomorrow night, we should be seeing the last quarter moon rising 
at about 1130. And the last quarter moon is actually a really, or a quarter moon in general, is really a great time to look at the moon. Here it is rising, this very bright object, of course. And the quarter moons are really great phases to look at the moon because the moon is being lit from the side. So we can tell that the moon is being lit from this left side as the right side of it is dark here. And what this means is that we get really dramatic shadows from these surface features, uh, which makes them really, really easy to see. So if you're looking for surface features on the moon, which is a really, really fun uh, thing to do, then these quarter moons are a really great time. A lot of times we uh, like to look at the moon during the full moon phase, but that is when the moon is being lit from uh, straight on, and it makes those surface features kind of difficult to pick out the mountains and craters and different things. So I thought we would look at a few of those. Now, the, one of uh, the easiest features to spot during this phase is the large bright crater known as the Copernus, Copernicus Crater. And right now it is located right here, just to the left of the Terminator. And the Terminator is just the line between the day side and the night side of the moon. So this crater here is Copernicus. Now, Stellarium unfortunately doesn't give us a really good view of the moon. So I thought I would switch to another tool here and show you the moon that way. So give me one second to switch my screen sharing. All right, and this tool is known as NASA's Solar System Trek. And this is actually a website um, and it's free to use for anyone. Uh, who would like to do so. And it's really amazing because it gives you an interactive model of the moon and some of the other planets in our solar system. And what's really neat is that this is not just a 3D render model, but this is actually using actual data sets from NASA. So you can go in here and search for different data sets, really high resolution imagery from different lunar reconnaissance orbiters, um, different cameras, uh, different types of data and overlay those onto this model and get a really cool view. So here right in the center is that same crater that you saw before. This is Copernicus Crater. Let's go ahead and zoom into it to get a really nice detailed view. Look at that. That's amazing. So Copernicus Crater is nearly 58 miles across. And this crater is relatively young. Astronomers think it uh, is less than 1 billion years old. If we zoom back out, we can see material flung from this crater as these bright streaks radiating out from the central crater. Above Copernicus Crater is this dark region, which is known as Mare Im Imbrium or the Sea of Rains. Now, Maria, which is the plural of Mare, are large, dark, basaltic plains on Earth's moon, formed by ancient volcanic eruptions. They were dubbed Maria, which is Latin for seas, by early astronomers who mistook them for actual seas. Now, they are less reflective than the highlands of the moon, and as a result, or excuse me, as a result of their iron-rich composition, and hence appear darker to the naked eye. The Maria cover about 16% of the lunar surface, mostly on the side visible from Earth. The curved line of mountains that you can see right down here to the southeast of this Mar, Mar, excuse me, Mar Embria, Embrium, excuse me, is known as Montes Apennines, named after the Apennine Mountains in Italy. And currently, they are disappearing into the darkness of the Terminator, separating lunar night and day. Now, these peaks may not look like much from this elevation, but these are some of the tallest mountains on the moon. And the last two peaks located in this region are actually where the Apollo 15 mission made its landing. So I thought it'd be fun to go see that landing site. So I'm going to turn on a high resolution layer here and here and I'm going to try to navigate us to the Apollo 15 landing site and as you can see 
uh, moon trek is overlaying different imagery from different satellites, which is really, really amazing. So let's zoom into this region here. And it may glitch out just a little bit, but hopefully it won't be too bad. And if we keep zooming in, there we go. Hopefully you can now see the Apollo 15 landing site. That's right. This right here, this object right here, is the Lunar Descent Vehicle. This is what carried the Apollo 15 astronauts down to the surface of the moon. And the bottom portion of it was left there when the top portion lifted off from the moon to return to Earth. Now, what amazes me the most, actually, are these tracks. Hopefully you guys can see these tracks through the live stream, but these are actually tracks from the lunar rover vehicle. The Apollo 15 mission was considered one of the most scientifically successful missions of the Apollo program, and it actually started the last three J-series missions that included the lunar rover and three-day stays. And it was actually the first mission where they were actually doing uh, science experiments on the moon and really exploring the surface of the moon. Previous to Apollo 15, they were just trying to get to the moon and survive there for, for a little while. Uh, but this is when they actually started staying for longer times and driving around the surface. And it's just amazing to me that you can see in this satellite imagery these tracks from the lunar rover. Up and to the left here is the site of some of the lunar surface exper science experiments, and you can see some of the equipment that was left there as well. And to the right of the descent vehicle is actually the lunar rover itself. It was parked and just left here with a camera facing the uh, descent vehicle to film the launch of the descent vehicle from the surface of the moon. And you can even follow these tracks. It gets kind of difficult. They get faint in some areas, but you can follow, oh, excuse me, there it is. You can follow these tracks to explore where the uh, lunar rover explored. They went down to this big dune here. This is a, a big dune. And they explored um, this winding valley. They drove right up to the edge of this winding valley. Um, it's just absolutely stunning to me that you can find this landing site. So if you do get a chance, oh, I should put the link to Solar System Trek in the comments for you guys. There you go. All right. And uh, yeah, if you, please do go check that out and uh, have some fun with it. And it's also just fun to, uh, to poke around. You can kind of go into a game mode if you want to and tilt Oh, look at that. Now you get a true sense of this, the scale of these mountains. Absolutely amazing. Turn around here. Look at that. You can explore the moon from, your vi from the comfort of your home. <laughs> You're looking at the moon, Jesse. Thanks for joining us. All right. Well, I think with that said, that is the end of my presentation. Um, thank you guys all for joining me. If you do have any comments, please do feel free to leave those. Uh, excuse me. If you have any questions for me, please feel free to leave those in the comments below. And if you did enjoy tonight's program, once again, please do consider making a donation. Uh, we really do appreciate any support that we can get. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed the program. I do these every Wednesday evening, so if you want to join us here again to learn more about the night skies uh, above Fort Collins, uh, please do that. And also, if you'd like to make a donation through our website, uh, you can do so at fcmod.org donate. Let's go back to the comments here and see uh, if we have any questions. Let's see. Looks like someone wants to know about the elevation of the uh, mountains? That's a really good question. Um, I don't know the exact elevations of each mountain. There's actually a series of mountains in that range, as you saw. Um, let's see. Looks like peaks rising as high as five kilometers or 3.1 miles. So those are some pretty tall moons, or excuse me, mountains. <laughs> yes, I love the moon too. It's uh, just a fantastic object to look at. 
Uh, Eliana wants to know when the constellation Leo comes out. That's a really good question, Eliana. And Leo is a springtime constellation, so unfortunately we won't see him again until the springtime. Yep, we're going to have to wait for some of the winter constellations to pass. Uh, Orion and Taurus and um, Canis Major and Canis Minor. Yeah, and then eventually we'll see Leo in the spring. Can you still see the flag on the moon? That is a really good question. Um, probably not from this imagery. That object itself would be probably too small to see with this imagery data, um, but they are still there. Um, I think I've heard that the color has washed out of the fabric. Obviously, there's nothing to protect the uh, objects on the moon from the UV rays of the sun. The moon does not have an atmosphere, um, and so they would probably just be bleached white, honestly. Let's see, let me scroll up and see if there's any other questions that I missed. All right. Excellent. Well, once again, if no one else has any questions, thank you again for joining me here. Um, and I hope that you do join me again for Night Skies of Fort Collins. And make sure you check out our website at fcmod.org. The museum is open a few days a week. Um, so if you want to come by and visit the museum, you can do that. We do have lots of precautions in place and you do need to buy tickets beforehand. Uh, but feel free to check out our website for all of that information. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next week, next Wednesday. Keep looking up, everyone. Have a good night.